Well, ladies and gentlemen, EV adoption across the region is growing fast, mostly due to its younger population and a forward-thinking approach. According to reports, the region has a unique opportunity to lead in new methods of transport and also serve as an ideal test bed for innovation and new technology. So our next session here at the EV Innovation Summit is going to give us a thorough review of the current status of the Middle East EV market, emphasizing significant trends, challenges, and opportunities. And who better to update us than our next guest? Please do join me in welcoming Heiko Seitz, who is the global e-mobility leader at PwC. A very warm welcome. Good, Good morning. You can hear me. I can hear that now. Fantastic. So we just heard it. The Middle East is all venturing into electric mobility. So let's look how that, you know, translate into numbers. So today I'm going to be your facts and figures guy. We at PwC have just concluded a new study, which you can actually download when you scan this QR code in greater detail. We have looked at how actually electric mobility is going to ramp up in the different parts of the GCC, and how that translates into costs and charging demand, etc. So we're just launching the UAE version this week, and then there's going to be a KSA version next week, and a Qatar version, and so on and so forth. And there's going to be trucks as well. So my name is Heiko Seitz. I lead electric mobility globally for PwC. I'm based out of Dubai, obviously also focused mostly here on the region. So it's great to be with you with you today. Let's look at the numbers and let's start with the question about how well does electric mobility actually function in this part of the world? Because there are lots of stereotypes. It's too hot, it doesn't work, you know, and then obviously Trump recently said if it's too cold it doesn't work either. So how does that translate in actual numbers? The ideal temperature for a battery EV is 20 degrees. That's perfect, you get the maximum range, you get the maximum charging speed. And then, obviously, as the world is not always at 20 degrees, we might move left and right of that one. And how does that translate? Norway is one of the countries in the world where we always say this is the, the best example for electric mobility. This is where it really works so well. But guess what? Norway is at approximately 5 uh, degrees average temperature throughout the year, and the Middle East is at approximately a little bit just below 30. That's the average temperature throughout the year. And actually, they have very, very similar charging profiles. So here you see, if we're moving 30 degrees above the ideal 20, which is the 50 that we might receive in a couple of weeks' time here, um, the charging or the average range of an electric vehicle might drop or will drop probably by approximately 30%. And then when it gets very cold in Norway, we, we have the same effects. So temperature does make a huge impact but it's manageable. And then obviously there is the second element of it. Uh, temperature also significantly affects the charging time. Uh, so here, uh, heat is not great, but it can work. And obviously there are new technologies that help us cool the cables, etc. So we have some R&D coming that, in that as well, and, and that might look different actually in one year or two years' time. So we wanted to look at the functionality. I believe there is a clear statement, yes, in July and in August it's not as comfortable to charge, but over the whole year it works very well and it's absolutely functional and practical for the Middle East. Now, how does that translate electric mobility in total cost? Because this is not just about do the cars really work, but how much do they cost? And right now, these are our latest numbers. The total cost of ownership of owning a battery electric vehicle is pretty much at par, both for passenger cars and light trucks. We're going to release in probably two weeks' time, also under the same QR code, so when you sign up there, you're going to always receive these per emails, the same number for heavy trucks, and buses. Uh, so I'm curious how the numbers would look like. I already know them, and they're going to be quite exciting. But basically, the message here, if you drive an EV nowadays, it's the same total cost of ownership from the point of buying the car, running it, and selling it again. Now here, you see there is a very big part down there, which is this, you know, Bordeaux or whatever red color that is, and that is the price tag. Now, that price tag will change significantly over the next years because it's going to be impacted by competition. 
If you look out there on the floor, or whoever was at Mobility Life three weeks ago, there are so many new brands coming mostly from Asia that will come in at lower price points and that will execute competition and pressure on the existing brands. So you can expect that the ticket value of an EV will significantly be impacted over the next years to come. That won't be the same case for internal combustion engine cars. Actually, they always go up a little bit year by year because uh, well, of different, uh, different cost factors. But the EV ticket price is going to go down. So the TCO for all the use cases will improve significantly over the next years to come. And that obviously comes down to the availability of car models. So quite interestingly, we looked at how many or how many percent of the car models that I can right now buy here in UAE are fully electric compared to combustion engine vehicles. And then we compared that to Europe. So right now in Europe, 25% or actually 26% of all available car models in the market for passenger cars and light trucks are battery electric. In the UAE, it's only 7%. So what's the key message? There are lots of models out there that could theoretically be sold here in the market, but for various reasons, they're not being sold here right now. And that obviously is also an incentive and very understandable one for distributors, etc., who make a lot of their money with after-sales services. Obviously, the maintenance cost of an EV are much lower. There is less potential to sell more parts. Keep in mind, there are many fewer parts in an electric engine compared to combustion engine. So obviously, there is a lower incentive of moving towards an electric fleet in the showroom if you have a, uh, also combustion engine car mix. And I absolutely get that. So we're helping the distribution companies also to think about how they can make more money uh, with selling services, et cetera, for EVs. But again, it's going to come down to competition. The more uh, Chinese, et cetera, all electric brands you have here in the market, the more you're going to see them here. And that's going to affect the mix. Our prediction for 2030 is that 70% of all car models in Europe will be fully electric. This is what, based on the announcements of the different OEMs. So theoretically and probably the number of EVs available in the market here in the Middle East will also maybe be, not be 70%, but will be closing to that. So lots of interesting things coming up. And I think these numbers with the 2030, Mark already mentioned it towards the end of this decade, electric mobility is going to go up. And I agree with that. So. Looking at the numbers again, what's the expected number or what's the percentage of electric cars in the sales mix? So here on the top line, you see total number of sales. So we see that in UAE, and I'm going to show the, the, you the Saudi numbers here, by the way, in comparison in a moment, and there's going to be an interesting key message. In UAE, the market grows, you know, more and more people move to this beautiful country and they need cars, uh, purchasing power is, is increasing steadily, so we see more and more cars being sold. What's quite interestingly that by 2035, we expect that 25% of the cars are uh, fully electric. So, you know, I think there could be more, right? When we look at Europe, etc., which is obviously a very different market, heavily regulated, there are mandates to phase out uh, combustion engine cars for countries, etc. How, how does that look like, like now in Saudi? Because in Saudi, there's a royal decree that mandates by 2030, 30% 30 of all new cars sold in Riyadh, at least, are to be fully electric. And that number looks very different suddenly. You see 64% in Saudi in 2035, and I'm going to flick back, 25. 64, 25. That is the impact of regulation incentivization of a market. Saudi Arabia, obviously, due to the fact that there is a huge uh, EV assembly production ecosystem uh, being created in Kingdom. I see uh, Lucid, uh, CEO of the Middle East, sitting in the first row, and I'm sure Sear is in the room and other brands. We have Newton here, uh, a car uh, a brand built here or assembled in, 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 in Abu Dhabi. Obviously, the Saudi agenda you know, drives to more stimulus in wanting to sell these cars. So there is a huge opportunity, an opportunity for policymakers 
to incentivize and stimulate the e mobility ecosystem by cer setting certain targets, right? And that doesn't even mean subsidizing. That means just by mandating or advising that a certain share should be battery electric, and suddenly the curve looks different. Now, going back to UAE, the increased availability or presence of electric vehicles in this country will lead to more charging demand. So we see right now the yellow curve is based on announcement where we see the availability of charging points in the UAE and the green line is the curve. So we see right now there is an increasing gap, which is equally a challenge for the infrastructure operator for the governments because we need to make sure that we can supply the fleets of the future with energy to continue moving. We want to avoid that there is a reason for range anxiety and we obviously need to make sure that a critical infrastructure is available to keep the fleet of the people moving. But equally, this is a great opportunity for many of you here who invest into charging infrastructure, who sell it, who build it, who operate it. There is a huge demand for more charging infrastructure. Of course, we also have to appreciate that it's not just as easy and say, I'm going to build a charging infrastructure. Also there, in different Emirates, you know, we, we have different regulation. There will be also probably more requirement to stimulate the rollout of charging infrastructure to make sure that CPOs really go and fill that gap. It is required. So how does this translate into energy demand? Because very often, no matter where I uh, speak about this topic in the world, I get the question, is there actually enough energy in the grid? And it's very simple, yes. So on the top line, we see the UAE energy generation capacity. And then the yellow line is energy demand going forward without EVs. So assume there are no electric vehicles, they never existed, they are at least they're not for sale here. And then you have the blue line, and I think it's very difficult to see the blue line because this increase is so little. So the message is, yes, we definitely have enough energy in the system, we just don't have enough green energy in the system to make that really fully uh, decarbonized, so mobility is electrified, but not necessarily decarbonized. And uh, yeah, so th this is where the journey goes. So we have energy security, that's a key message. Um, and then how does this translate into CO2 savings? Because in the end, we want to make sure uh, that battery electricity, and then also hydrogen, by the way, reduce the CO2 footprint. So this is the curve based on uh, these energy production lines. So this is not meaning Oh, I wish I had more green energy. This is the green energy mix as it will be rolled out in the UAE as per the plans. So by 2035, we will be able, thanks to more uh, green energy and electrification of fleets, save close to 11% in CO2 emissions. I think that's the good news. So I hope that was insightful, but let me give you some recommendations. They were already implicit in some of the things that I said. So we really have to think about how we can help the ecosystem stakeholders in incentivizing EV adoption by policy and regulation. Uh, I personally, I'm not such a huge fan of subsidies, to be honest. I see them in Europe. They're helpful in the beginning of an ecosystem. I think for the car side, we don't really need subsidies. That's my personal opinion. But I think on the infrastructure side, it sometimes helps because it's a capex-heavy business. Uh, so something to think about here as well. There is a strong need to make sure that there are more EV models available in country to diversify the model range. So we've seen the, the differentiator between Europe and the Middle East. These numbers are out there. Uh, luckily, we're seeing more and more here available in the market, but there is much more room up uh, for, 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 for more models. We have to accelerate the rollout. I think the gap that we saw, so this business opportunity is there. It can be leveraged. Again, the policymaker will have to take an even more active role into supporting the ecosystem in different Emirates. And then obviously, we also have to make sure that using your car is as user-friendly as possible. I personally drive an electric vehicle here in the UAE. Um, you know, this week I'm going to take my family for four days off uh, to, we're going to drive from Dubai to Saudi Island. We're going to spend four days with our EV in Abu Dhabi and obviously I have to safely and comfortably bring the family back at high temperatures where we have also lots of air conditions. So, you know, there is definitely, it's not the first time I do that, a need to further improve customer experience to make 
the use of electric vehicles as seamlessly as possible, as you already have that in my home country, Germany, where it's really easy to drive an EVs. But I see, I'm very confident that we're creating this ecosystem and with all the great solutions that you all represent here in the room, we can make it happen together. So on that note, I would like to conclude. And if there are any questions now, if you want to challenge me or ask anything, I already see a first hand, two hands, fantastic. There's a microphone in the middle. Please step to it and very happy to take your questions. Yes, hi. Hello. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, uh, this is Bashar. I have one question now. Um, we can see in recently the share prices of uh, many um, uh, companies in the AV industry are uh, declining. Mm. So first question is, uh, any idea why this is one? Uh, is it concerning, I mean? Uh, secondly, uh, is it concerning for uh, business owners who uh, are in the, let's say, infrastructure uh, charging business? Is this something also that could be a concern, or what's, 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 uh, what are we expecting in future? So the, just to, to recap, so the first part is view on share prices on some uh, OEMs in the Middle East, and the second part was was, is this something concerning for uh, the EV uh, yeah. sector in general? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, because it's not very clear mm. what is the reason uh, most of the shares in, yeah. uh, for companies in this market are declining uh, very uh, Absolutely. fast. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad this question up uh, because, you know, it's, you know, a conversation that is, that is always, always coming. What's, what's happening? You know, how, how confident are we that? And rather than commenting on the share price of companies, which, which are not as a, as, 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 a, as a audit firm in a position to do so, let me comment you on a very similar uh, setup that we currently have in Europe, where we suddenly have a lot of uncertainty. You know, uncertainty about is this really the end again of electric mobility or is this progressing? Right? So for me, the attractiveness of transferring or transforming towards electric mobility is driven by mainly three things. It's the functional parity of electric mobility, it's the price parity, how attractive is it to the user, and how convenient which very much comes down to customer journey, but mostly down to charging infrastructure. The functional parity we have, when you have the charging infrastructure, which is the last part what I had, it really works well to drive an EV. So we have now come to the point that we have a technology that is sufficiently mature to provide the user uh, the convenience. Actually, it's for me more convenient to drive an EV because every morning I leave the house with a full battery and I don't have to worry about uh, refueling, etc. And now comes the most critical one, which is our wallet. We just saw the numbers. So here right now we have price parity, the price is going to go down. Open question to the audience that you don't need to answer. If you have a premium product where you're going to save money, what are you going to go for? I think the logical choice is you're going to go all electric down the line. In Europe, the TCO, the total cost of ownership, without subsidies is already 15% below the one of an internal combustion engine car, battery electric versus combustion engine car. So that will move the needle towards battery electricity. However, OEMs and distributors have a strong interest in selling more internal combustion engine car because they have invested billions and billions, probably trillions of dollars into existing value chains. And just moving from that away is horrific, a horrific change for OEMs. So we always have to understand the toughness of the transition. And there is a lot of media news around it. But let me tell you, summing up in a very short sentence, I believe that electric mobility Will be more price. Uh, of, well, it will be more attractive for the user going forward from a price and functionality perspective. And that's why I believe that the ecosystem will transition there. And okay. that's hopefully good news for yeah. every single OEM that might have a challenging st uh, share price these days, and that will hopefully translate in a better one going forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great question. Sorry for the long answer. That was a very complex one. Any more questions?
No, then I'm looking forward to give maybe back even some time. No, actually, we only one minute. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, and looking forward to greater conversations down there. Thank you.